Good morning. Fresh from the production line and R&D line, the QXI quad zone detector. We'll be housing with uh, four different models, the QXI-ST, which stands for standard, QXI-DT, which is our microwave, QXI-R, which is the wireless, and the wireless microwave. From a high mounting position, this is how we've pegged this detector. When we look at our low mount, the detector can be mounted a low mount, which is in our Alex series, as well as in our Beric series. And on the high mount, we have a little bit of a gap. Our, our mounting height on a high mount only starts at 2.5 meters to three meters, but we have nothing between that 2.2 to about 2.7. Uh, and this is why this product was uh, designed. The other thing as well is if you look at the HS, it's a slightly big detector, which is a more commercial detector. So on a commercial, uh, sorry, domestic application, the detector looks quite unsightly because it's quite large. So what we've gone and done here is we've redesigned the detector to, more, to be more aesthetically pleasing and to fit that position between the 2.2 to 2.3 uh, mounting heights. Four different models, as, as I discussed earlier. And as you can see from a cosmetic point of view, they've really changed the design on this detector. Um, if you look at the detector itself, it has a nice smooth front. It has a beautiful lens. There's no lip in it whatsoever. It has a beautiful back ba uh, backing and it's got a bracket to complement it with. The four models, as I said, the QXI-ST, which is the standard, the QXI-DT, microwave, QXI-R, which is wireless, and QXI-RDT. You'll notice that we've moved away from D which normally stands for microwave, um, which is DAM and that sort of stuff. And the reason why I've been so is because of the anti-masking function. Some of the, 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 the features that we've got, we've now got a 12 meter complement with 120 degrees. That 120 degrees from left to right is actually 15 meters in distance. We've changed the design to this nice new friendly uh, sleek compact design. Um, on the bottom, as you can see on the wireless model, we've now put a space in there for our, our transmitters. It will also house our transmitters that, and you guys call them the LC versions, the low current versions, we have to put a third party device. So it doesn't really matter what device you're gonna put inside there, it's gonna house it nice uh, uh, nice, and, uh, and you won't have to make a plan for a special bracket and put it on the side and sits inside. The dual tech, as I spoke earlier, is a 10.525 with the anti-blocking feature. The battery operated model, um, is available, and that is in the microwave as in the normal standard. Uh, we now, unlike the Alex, where it doesn't have an, uh, an animal tolerance, the QXI does have an animal tolerance. We've also upgraded the library on the SMDA uh, logic, and um, we've upgraded some new features on the bracket. We've, we've messed the bracket up with the same color as the housing, and the RP rating is 54. The reason why we've kept it at 54 is to keep the cost down. Um, if we put it up to an IP rating of 65, it would involve more brackets, more O-rings, and it would involve increasing the cost. So we would just want to make this as cost effective as possible. Getting back to the mounting height, and as you can see there, it's 2.2 to 2.7, which is a nice mounting height, because what happens with the HX and on a phone and a couple of the sites is that when you mount it at 2.5 and above, some houses with the eaves coming down, it would actually block the detector at the nine to 10 meter radius because the eave was coming down. Now we can bring it down to the 2.2, 2.3 complement. So we are going to be able to get that 12 meters. Mounting at 0.8 to 1.2 is a sort of normal, uh, what we call as a pet alley. And this is where the, the pet is able just to walk underneath the detector. The and logic, which is a quad element where we put two dual elements uh, into one quad element, which I will explain at this slide over here. So as you can see on the right hand side, if you look at a HX40 or HX80, quite a big detector. And the reason why I've been so, it's basically like two detectors um, on top of one another. And each detector has a dual element. And what happens that has to happen is what we call as AND logic. So both have to activate simultaneously in order to go into an activation. What happens with that dual uh, pyro there is that the one will shine at a certain degree and the other at a lesser degree. They're just creating a gap. And that's what gives us our pet tolerance. 
So the, the animal is able to only break one zone edge at a time or one dual element, and that given it its pet immunity. With the QXI, what we've gone and done is we've now put a quad element, which is pretty much the same thing spelled different. So we put two dual elements in one quad element. The only difference is with this quad element, it doesn't have a higher pet tolerance as the HX, where the HX has got up to 40 centimeters. This has a pet tolerance of about 25 to 30 centimeters. As you can see over here, if you look at the uh, detection pattern or zone edges, that one in the blue there, that's the top part of the, the quad element. And the gray one, hopefully you can see that because it's a bit lights on this presentation. That is the zone edge for the bottom part of the quad element. When we put it on pet alley, uh, it doesn't really take or really matter what size the pet is because it just goes parallel to the head. On the QXI-DT and the wireless DT, we've now complemented it with a microwave. Uh, guys, I would strongly try um, push this. And the reason why I've been so is that microwave gives it that third tier. And what I mean by the third tier is that if you have to look at all the tiers which needs to activate this detector. So the first part has to activate is a positive negative threshold of the quad element, then the bottom positive negative of the quad element, and then as well as a microwave. Passive infrared, as you know, is susceptible to, to heat. So if you have it pointed onto say vegetation or a moving branch or an unstable area, or, or in fact going out to infinity that it can't get itself a reference point, it creates, and one bad apple will spoil the bunch. And what happens to the unfortunate reality is you can get a nuisance law. What happens with microwave, microwave complements to that 12 meter and it pretty much starts it like a brick wall. And also microwave is not susceptible to heat. And you guys get some pretty excessive heat there. So especially up the, the coast there where it's quite windy and very hot and severe and dry conditions, it's gonna make this detector that much more stable. If you have to uh, look at the, the, the detection pattern, here it is at a 2.2 to 2.7. And uh, what you can see is all the beautiful zone edges and the complements that the PIR has got. And as you can see, the microwave also does 120 degrees. And as you can see, it just stops at that 12 meter complement. If we put it on pet alley, um, it will be just be mounted between 0.8 to 1.2. Just go straight out. I'm going to go into pet a little bit later and all the sort of like the do's and the don'ts. Uh, we have upgraded the SMDA and what, what I mean by upgrading the SMDA is that our engineers actually study the wave patterns and characteristics of exterior temperatures and trees and dogs and sunlight and UV lights and moving plants and all that type of stuff. And how they actually do that is that they mount a detector with a camera, and what they do is they have this wired into a software. Uh, what that turns out to be is that you guys have got a detector that has a small degree of intelligence. So it is able to distinguish between um, a, a genuine activation to a, a nuisance alarm. Bear in mind that we can't uh, do all different types of activations. The, the SMD library is getting smarter and smarter as we go along and as we're learning more and more wave patterns. And this is the advantage of that digital processing. On the pyros, and I've explained this guys to you guys before, is the double conductive shielding. This is nice so that a detector gets direct sunlight or somebody drives up with car headlights or something to that degree, it can actually just filter those lights out and it can still uh, remain stable and still detect uh, in those type of conditions. On the microwave, uh, what we've gone and done is that we, sorry, hold on. On the, on the microwave side, uh, we, we've changed the design a bit. And what we've gone and done is we've called what we call the tough mode, where we've now put a ceramic board uh, on the microwave with a gold plate and antenna. Uh, the reason why being so is obviously gold plates, it doesn't rust it, it doesn't rust. And a ceramic board is a much more tougher material. Where our positions use a glass epoxy board uh, with tin plated antennas. Um, if you're ever fortunate enough to find an old detector or old microwave detector that's been in the field for about two, three years, open it up and have a look at that board. You'll see it's discolored, you'll see that the tin starts folding. And if you have to actually look at 
that microwave or test that microwave, you'll see it, it wouldn't probably have performed as well as it did on day one. With the ceramic board and the gold plates and antenna, whether you buy the detector as a month old or three, four years old, you'll see our microwave is still working 100% to spec. A couple of mechanical features. So as you can see, the microwave is housed at the top there. That's the ceramic board and, and gold plated antennas. Uh, then we've got the mirror. That mirror is for creep zone. So if you desire a creep zone, you flip it down. If you don't want a creep zone, you just uh, simply flip it up. We have the PC terminals um, on the bottom there. Please, and as you can see with PC terminals, TR, what that stands for, for anti, well, it's actually anti-masking. Common alarm is for the alarm circuit, and TPTP is for your tamper for the front and the back of the device. Complemented with the dispatch settings to turn things on and off, which I'll cover just now. And on the right-hand side, you can see the wireless model. Uh, pretty much like your WLX, the battery now gets housed from the front of the detector and can be changed uh, from the front. All right, on the, the masking plate or, or masking strips, um, what we've gone and done is we've, we've, we've numbered them with uh, alphabetical letters. So if you have some zone edges pointed into an unstable area because the same one, one bad apple will spoil the bunch, the unfortunate reality is that it will start uh, a false alarm and create nuisance alarms. So what we're able to do is what you do is you just take a corresponding uh, masking strip that corresponds with that letter on that zone edge. You simply just put it on there and you at least got 70% of a stable detector than 100% of an unstable detector. How you take the lens out, pretty simple. The two little orange circles, you push there with your finger. And then the two red circles, you push there with your side and the lens just simply pops out. You don't even need a screwdriver. To put it back in, you simply insert from the side first. You lock it in, then the right side. Gently push it from uh, the top side and the bottom side, and the lens clips uh, uh, nicely back into place. Uh, pet Alley, a um, couple of things that you must do. You must make sure that the PC board has got two settings to exactly like your Alex, where you have a P and an M setting. What you need to do is take that PC board. You've actually got to unclip it, pull it out, and put it down, and make sure it's on the P setting. Then the mirror, you need to put to the up position. Um, then tighten the screw so the PC board doesn't move and you're ready to rock and roll. You now have a pet alley. If you are gonna sell pet alley, please make sure that, and they emphasize this on the, on the presentation, is that the zone edges terminate to a wall. If you've got some zone edges going out to infinity and they're gonna hang in the, in the air, what's gonna happen from there is that the, you open yourself up to false alarms, because, what happens is when guys install alarm systems is they don't take into account every single zone edge and where it actually goes. They pretty much put a detector, plonk it up, and they just hope it, it works. And this is where you guys come in. So if your client has mounted the detector, just make sure even if it's in an embankment, it's fine, or on a wall, but as long as it does terminate. If you sell the microwave one, the microwave will sleep be slightly better because the microwave will act like, act like a wall. And it, that third tier will actually complement it to 12 meters, um, even though your PIR does go out to infinity. To open it up, all you simply do is you just use, and you must use a fairly big screwdriver with a flat front, um, otherwise it damages the, the, the housing. You just simply put it in there, give it a slight turn and the lens and clips. If your client so desires that they want to have a screw inside there, in the packaging, there is a little white screw and you can lock it in with a screw. Walk test mode, uh, once again, pretty much a feature I love is if your technicians are battling with the detection or saying it's going a bit sleepy, always get your technician to unclip it first uh, for the first three minutes. And the reason why I've been so, what it does, it takes all the digital processing out and it allows you just to to show you exactly where those zone edges are and where it's detecting with that processing. After three minutes, it will flash for five times to say that it's gone out of walk test mode and all the dispatch settings and all the algorithms um, will be implemented in the detector to complement it and make it a stable detector. The 
unfortunate reality as well is that sometimes you will get some technicians that will change the settings um, or turn the settings off for that matter and say that the settings are not working. Just bearing in mind that it, uh, it takes three minutes for it to implement and once it's been implemented, then the feature that you've turned on or off, you can test that feature. We have a tamper output only on the wireless models, um, which is on the front and the back. Uh, it's exactly like the WXI. You have to put that third screw in there. If you don't put that third screw in there, the tamper is not going to work. And the reason why we put tamper on the wireless, because if you've got a wire and you pull it off the wall, it's going to go into the long state, the circuit's going to remain open. But in the wireless, they can still the detect and put in the pocket and off they go. At least if they pull the detector off the wall here, you guys are going to get an alarm or a tamper, especially if you're using your X-Wave 2. The brackets, uh, we're going to have a ceiling mount and a wall mount. Uh, the code's slightly different to the Alex, and the Alex bracket is, is virtually exactly the same. In fact, it is the same. The only difference is the Alex bracket is a different color. It's more creamy color. So if you sell an Alex bracket to go with it, it will work. The only difference is that it looked like you're selling a bleached uh, bracket to a client you might say, giving them second-hand detectors, uh, second-hand brackets or something. So the code does have an extra W on there. Uh, so it's a CA-1W and then it's another W in brackets. That is the matching pair for the QXI series. Getting to the dip switch settings. Marcel, this is for you. Uh, LED on and off, dip switch number one. Please bear in mind that the LED will only switch off after three minutes if you do decide to turn it off after the walk test mode. Alarm output, normally open, normally close, normally close, going to alarm panel, normally open, going into a CCTV or a NBR. Uh, Dust switches three and four, that is your sensitivity setting. Alex, as you know, has only got one setting, that's it, can't change it. This one, we've given you a, a, a more of a, of a variety. We're able now to put it on a low, a medium, a high, and a super high, all depending on your application. Uh, the wireless, uh, the wireless is we put it to a five second and 120 second uh, complement. Marcel, what will happen with this one over here is that with our other detectors, if if they leave dish switch number one up, it will still fire every second. With this one over here, what happens when the walk test elapse, uh, um, elapses up to three minutes on the QXR and the QXRDT? It will implement those two detectors, um, those two settings over there. Uh, so, what will happen after three minutes? If you're testing a wired version, it will catch you every single time, every second. But on the wireless, it will then say to itself, "Okay, I'm out of my walk test mode, and if I get an activation and if somebody moves in front of it, it'll activate, but then it will reset for five seconds." The danger about that is that your technician walks, you'll see one activation carrier and walk in saying this thing's going to sleep. It's not, it's just taking those battery saving modes and it automatically implements it. Then we've got anti-blocking, um, which is, uh, you can turn on and off. And the reason why being so is that if you put the detector at a low mount, it's very advisable to turn the anti-blocking off. And the reason why being so is that if you put the anti-blocking on because of the microwave, if you walk directly past the detector or stand near the detector for a couple of seconds and then walk away and the power goes quiet, you could get some nuisance alarms. So we recommend that anti-blocking only be used on the high mount. Uh, anti-blocking sensitivity is a low sensitivity setting or a high sensitivity setting. What we've done now is we've uh, implemented a common battery, pretty much the same as your WXR, where the battery gets housed from the front. And for the transmitter device, especially for your, your LC versions, uh, we've given you a dummy battery. That dummy battery will then force the positive and negative terminals into the transmitter, so it will transfer power from the CR3123 through the device itself through to the third party transmitter. How that actually works is, I've done a couple of slides here. The battery, the, the, the transmitter gets housed inside uh, the back of the housing. The reason why I've done that first slide on the left hand side is to show you that's probably one of the biggest mags that we've got in the field at the moment and it fits in there nice and snug. So even if you are upselling to a client that has an existing wireless system and they have to put third party devices, we're able to house that mag. In the middle over there, 
we've got the uh, CR123s. And what happens is the CR123 then gets taken out of the mag, so you don't have to buy a CR123. You'll put the CR123 there, and the plastic lug that comes with the R or the DT version, and it holds the battery terminals in place on the transmitter. Now, what this does is that the battery will do the day-to-day -day operation on the device itself, as well as supply power to the mag itself, and everything gets supervised from the one power. On our older models, like talking five, 10 years ago, we had two independent batteries, a battery to run the transmitter and a battery to run uh, the device itself. That was quite dangerous because if your battery went down and the device itself it was still fine on the transmitter, when the panel did its roll call, it would still see uh, from a supervision point of view that the, the wireless device was fine, but meanwhile, the device had gone down. You're not gonna have that now because when you start getting the battery low on the sensor itself, it's gonna transmit through to the transmitter transmitter is going to on its roll call say listen hold on wait a minute i uh, have a battery low here and then the technician or end user can just slim, simply unclip the front take a new ocr123 plug it in close up the lid and off you go and perform your tests here are some applications from a residential point of view so as you can see we've got a nice 120 degree complement and on the left hand side you can see we've got it mounted at about 2.2 2.3 .2, and on the right hand side, they've put it up at a higher complement. As you can see, it gives you a nice field of detection. On the right hand side there, we've got detection for application for warehouses and industrial areas. And because of the anti-masking feature, we can sell this in, the, in, the, in commercial applications. And on the bottom, from one of those really cosmetic sort of uh, Camps Bay type of houses, we can sell it at a low amount if they had pets. And as you can see, it blends lovely uh, nicely into the, the cosmetics of the house. Guys, that's it. Um, if you've got any questions, please just send me an email or you've got my telephone number. And once you've got your brands, uh, happy selling. Um, and guys, good luck and let me know how it goes. Cheers, bye.